Memoirs of the Reverend William C. Burns, Chapter 19, 1858-1863, Old Scenes and New. While Mr. Burns was thus laboriously preparing the way for future laborers in the comparatively hard and unkindly soil around Chateau, his mission and brother had been reaping a rich and almost continuous harvest at the parent station in Amoy. His young colleague, Mr. Douglas, had entered on his work at a most auspicious moment and had abundantly shared in that blessing which for the last three years had so signally rested on that favored field and on all connected with it. The number of converts and all inquirers in connection with all the societies increased rapidly. The zeal, love, and hopeful faith alike of missionaries and of native dis disciples deepened, and the word of the Lord sounded out more and more widely over the whole region round. The valleys of the hill country on the mainland to the west had become in particular one wide and busy harvest field of souls. The sacred fire kindled the year before at a single spot, spread gradually, chiefly through the spontaneous zeal of converts and native evangelists to the towns and villages around, and one living church after another rose up as light amidst the darkness. Speedily the daughters, daughter societies of Bay Pei and C-H-I-O-H-B-E-Y rivaled alike in numbers and in fever the mother congregation at Petura, while lesser groups of Christian worshipers were scattered here and there over the valleys and hills. And in the absence of European laborers or of trained native evangelists, the members of the infant churches themselves became the willing and zealous messengers of the cross, and the word of the Lord spread as by its own divine inheritance might from village to village and from heart to heart. Sometimes even it would be found that a single soul having heard the divine message, perhaps only once at some central mission station, had carried some living seeds of truth home to some sequestered village among the hills, and there alone among heathen idolaters, by feeble prayers to the true God and rude endeavors to keep the Christian Sabbath nursed the sacred germ until some Christian evangelist came to water and to foster it. The aspect of the scene as it presented itself to the young missionary on his first survey of the field was thus exceedingly exhilarating. A glorious work of God, said he, January 3rd, 1856, has been wrought in this place, and he is still working. And by his dealings we seem warranted to expect that all this is but the merest beginning of the abundant blessing that he is about to bestow on this place in the neighborhood. For several years after this port was opened, the labor seemed almost in vain, and when about seven years ago the drops began to fall, they were very, very few. But somewhat about two years ago the conversions became more numerous, and now the number of living adult members is London Missionary Society here and at Koh Leung 150. American Mission here, 100. At CHIOH B E Y, 22. And our station at Petura, 25. Of these, the London Society had 39 female members, and the Americans about the same number. You can now judge by what I have said as to the past and the present, while as to the future. Our hopes rest under the mercy and love of God on various reasons, partly the zeal and prayerfulness stirred up at home, partly on the singularly steady progress and continue proportionately increase of the converting work, which is also particularly free from any excesses of enthusiasm or superstition, and very much on the fact that the converts, almost all, are full of zeal to lead their relatives and friends to become partakers of the light precious faith and to instruct in the scriptures and the doctrine those who are younger in Christ. They seem, so far as I can see, to delight to tell those who are still without of the grace and peace which they have found. There are altogether 15 native Christians employed as co-porters and evangelists by the various missions. These assist in conducting the services in the chapels and quite as often conduct them themselves. They also go out into the streets and the neighboring villages and towns, distributing tracts and testaments, preaching and conversing with the people. When about a year after his arrival, the missionary was able himself to preach in the Chinese language. The evangelist work went on still more vigorously. From the wise and judicious director,
he became now the energetic leader of the company of preachers, traversing in every direction the whole region around Amoy, till there was scarcely one important center of population on either side of the Changchao um, estuary in which the joyful sound had not been heard. Old stations flourished and new fields opened up, which seemed scarcely less ripe for the harvest. Solemn did a month pass in which there were not in some of the churches inquirers to be instructed and converts to be baptized, while the old members for the most part visibly grew in faith, in knowledge, and in Christian activity and zeal. A numerous school of the prophets, too, for the training of native evangelists and teachers, flourished under the missionaries' own care at the central station at Amoy, and held out the prospect of still more active and extensive operations in the time to come. But this bright picture had also its dark shadow. It is impossible, but that offenses shall come. Tares will ever mingle with the wheat, even in the richest and fairest fields of the church, and the infant churches of Fokin were no exception to this universal rule. The mother congregation at Petura, in particular, had become lately the subject of grave solicitude to the missionaries. Dissensions had arisen about the building of a chapel. One or two cases of scandal had occurred among the members. Death and change had of late visibly thinned the ranks of the little society, while few new disciples were raising up to fill the vacant places. It seemed indeed as if the fresh spirit of life, under which all at first they had grown exceedingly, at once in numbers and in fever, had passed away, and that the work had become stationary or even retrograde. It was in these circumstances that Mr. Burns had been urged by his brother missionary to return, at least for a season, to the scene of his former labors and to bear his share of the increasing anxieties and responsibility of their common work. On his arrival at Petura, he found the evils of which he had heard less serious than he had feared, but still sufficiently grave to call for a prompt and vigorous corrective measures. On February 22, 1859, he writes from Memoir. There are two persons there who have fallen away from their Christian profession, but neither of them had from the beginning, as far as I learn, any marked evidence of a work of grace. The only really melancholy case that I know of is one who was chapel keeper and afterwards a preacher, but who, there is reason to fear, has again fallen under the power of opium smoking. The general aspect of affairs, however, as it presented itself to him after so long an absence, was on the whole most cheering. I wonder, says he, more than ever I did at the reality and preciousness of the work of the divine spirit at Petua and the neighboring stations. May the time be near when new and like glorious manifestations of the Lord's saving power shall be witnessed in this and in all lands. Yesterday we had about 40 of the converts in this neighborhood assembled at the communion at Petua. And today, in coming here, fully a dozen accompanied me, most of them returning home. It was a sweet contrast with the state of things five years ago when we first visited Petura and when in this whole neighborhood there was probably not a single follower of the land. These were, where had they been? These from the land of, of Sain. O oh, glorious day, when the fullness of the Gentiles shall be converted unto Emmanuel, when all nations shall be blessed in him and all nations shall call him blessed. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Take unto thee thy great power and reign. Two of the offending members were, after all gentler means of remedy, had been tried in vain, cut off from communion, while two others were subjected to the faithful but loving discipline of the church with a view to their repentance and restoration. Remedial measures, too, of a more permanent kind, were at the same time adopted. A regular body of office bearers, according to the Presbyterian model, were was cons cons constituted at Petura, as had been already done at Amoy and Chiobi, the whole proceeding of the election being conducted in a most orderly manner in an assembly of the native church itself. Another measure not less memorable originated with the native brethren themselves and is in its whole circumstances and history deeply touching. A fortnight ago, writes Mr. Burns, at the incident of one of the elders at Chiobe, who is one of the Petura converts, and was one of the chief founders, as he is one of the pillars of the Chiobe Church. And Petua, in concert with the Chiobe Church, observed a season of solemn prayer and fasting, that they might seek the return of the Lord's favor to Petura. 
I was at Chio Bay when this season was observed. Tuesday, the 16th of August, there was a large attendance of church members, and when the elder I had alluded to, I hyphen J U, began to pray, he was so aff affected that he could hardly proceed. The preacher at Chio Bay, Tolo, who began his work as a preacher at Petura in 1854, was also sobbing aloud. It was evident that the Lord was in the midst of us. Another event of the deepest interest occurred this year, which is so strikingly illustrative of the whole character of the mission and of the, the infant churches to which it has been given birth that I shall relate the circumstances at length in the words of one of the missionaries. Last month, says Mr. Douglas, a step in advance was taken by the Amoy Church, which seemed to me most important and the most cheering which has been taken since the church was organized. It was the setting apart of two native evangelists entirely supported by the native church in Amoy under the care of the American missionaries. The novelty and cheering interest of this step does not lie in the use of native evangelists. These have long been employed and found quite indispensable in the instruction and extension of the church. But the singular in interest of what has just been begun is that these two native evangelists are as completely independent of foreign money as the ministers of Canada or Australia. Of course, the church itself is still dependent for instruction on the foreign missionaries and on agents paid by them. But in the case of these two new evangelists, a beginning has been made of the self-supporting principle. It was, it was after abundant prayer and careful counting of the cost that this work was begun. The choice of the two brethren honored by the master to undertake this office was quite independent of the missionaries, the names being only submitted for approval or rejection after the choice, before the setting apart. On that day, the native members of the other church at Amoy, that namely under the care of the London Missionary Society, were invited to be present. Almost all the missionaries of the several societies were there, and already both that church and the younger churches on the mainland are considering whether they be able to follow the example so well set to them. The field chosen for these new laborers is the unevangelized portion of the island of Amoy, which is just the whole island about 30 miles in circumference, except the town itself. How wonderful and glorious the ways of God. While he is opening up our way to the towns and cities at a greater distance around, he is taking care that the populous villages of the immediate neighborhood be not neglected. Amongst these interesting and fruitful pa pastoral cares, the more extended and aggressive work of the mission went on vigorously. The missionaries, using the gospel boat as their home in going from place to place in evangelistic work, for which the rivers of China afford so great faculty. Another attempt was made to effect a permanent lodgment within the walls of the great city of Changchow, but was for the time defeated in consequence of a singular incident. A week ago, writes Mr. Burns, we were living near the district magistrate's office. He had gone out about midnight on Sabbath the 13th to inspect the streets, and just as he was passing our lodging, one of the assistants, when the other had gone to rest, suddenly, in the fullness of a heart, began aloud to sing a Christian hymn. The unusual sound attracted the, the Mandarin. He listened, and hearing that a foreigner was there, he next day sent to ask us to leave the city. In another direction, however, some hopeful tokens had begun to appear in places to which Mr. Douglas's eye had been long and anxiously turned. At Anhai, a town about 18,000 or 20,000 inhabitants, situated at the head of a long inlet about 35 miles northeast from Amoy, an opening had been found for the truth, which soon led to the establishment of a regular mission station and to the foundation of one of the most numerous and faithful of the Chinese native churches. It was in the midst of these interesting and congenial labors that Mr. Burns received the following touching lines from his early friend, James Hamilton, which I am tempted to insert as a fragment memorial, both of the writer himself and of that gracious, benighted friend whose character he embalms. 48, Euston, um, it's E-U-S-T-O-N, Square, London, Northwest, May 10, 1859. My dear friend, Two hours ago, I received a notification of what will doubtlessly be communicated to you in fuller detail from home, the entrance into his 
everlasting rest of your beloved father on the morning of Sabbath last. It was only a few weeks after his retirement from his ministerial work so that the heavenly Sabbath has followed sooner than he hoped. It has been a wonderful, serene, and blameless life. And in the remarkable visitation of his people 20 years ago, he has been a rarely happy minister. The announcement has sent my own thoughts back to Kilseth and Strathblame and to incidents that transpired full many years ago. Are gone. To you in your far place of sojourn, the tidings will be very affecting. It is touching to think that you will see his face no more. But oh, how blessed is his case, who now sees Jesus face to face, and who, from a life of prayer, has passed to one of praise. Last January I saw him and your dear mother in Glasgow. They had come in to attend the meeting on behalf of China in Free St. Matthews, Dr. S. Miller's. Your father seemed to me very much the same as ever. He sat on a chair which was placed for him besides the pulpit, and the congregation evidently eyed him with much reverency and affection. The fathers, where are they? I ought to feel it's solemn now to know that we are getting into the forefront, no generation any longer between ourselves and the great reckoning. With love to all the brethren, I remain affectionately yours, James Hamilton. In October 1859, Mr. Burns was, again, on his way towards a new and distant sphere of labor, the special service for which he had come to Fokin, and for which the peculiar uh, relation in which he stood to the inland churches there gave him a special advantage, had been satisfactorily accomplished, and now he longed to return to his old work of pioneering the way of other laborers in regions where the gospel had not yet found an entrance. The nearest and most natural center of operations was fuh Chow, the capital city of the province to which Amoy belongs. And here, accordingly, he spent most of the next year, quickly acquiring the new dialect, preparing a hymn book for the use of the infant church, and unweariedly sowing, as usual, the gospel seed. Of these labors, the following notice has been kindly furnished to me by an esteemed Christian brother. When Mr. Burns, says the Reverend C. Hartwell, one of the oldest missionaries of the American board at uh, Fu Chao, was come to Fu Chao in October 1859, he divided his labors between preaching in English and studying and preaching in Chinese. He spent his Sabbath at the Paconda Anchorage. Footnote, the Paconda Anchorage is a place where large ships lie, about 12 miles below the city. It is so called from a Paconda on Paconda Island. And a footnote. Preaching on shipboard to seamen and others who came to his services. The weekdays he spent at Fuchao, studying the spoken dialect, and for a short time preaching two evenings in a week in the Amoy dialect to the tinfoil beaters and others from the Amoy region living here, who were induced by special invitation to attend his services in our church. Besides attending the services of other missionaries, he himself held others in our churches in which at first the native helpers did the preaching. He simply directing the exercises and occasionally suggested points to them upon which he wished them to speak. He was quite successful in this mode of effort, and the helpers as well as others were benefited by the meetings. He also assisted us by visiting some of our outstations in the country and laboring in these places. One of our present outstations was commenced by him. He had opened a chapel some miles back of the place in a smaller village, but had been unable to secure one in this large village, until his effort was successful. He labored at this place for some time, and several persons manifested some interest in the truth, but none of them have yet given evidence of piety. When he left Fu Chao the last time, he gave funds to employ an extra helper for this village for some time, and the outstation has been fully manned by us ever since. But for unknown reason, it has hitherto proved our least successful field of labor. Not desiring to open a new station at Fuchao, during his stay here, Mr. Burns sought to aid each of the three missions already established as opportunity afforded and occasion seemed to require. He did not confine his assistance to any one of them. He sought for openings where he could be useful in promoting the work generally. 
and in this he was very successful. His catholicity of feeling made him ever ready to aid at any weak point. The particulars in which, as it seems to me, he most aided our mission, and in fact the others also, were his excellent influence upon our native assistants, and in successfully introducing the use of the, the hymns among us in our worship. Our helpers soon learned to feel a great regard for Mr. Burns, and their piety was quickened and deepened, apparently, through his influence. His power over them arose from his own deep piety, his accurate knowledge of the Chinese language, the great fund of Christian knowledge at his command, and the singleness of purpose which he ever manifested. He felt it to be a privilege to have our native preachers under his influence and instruction. Previous to his coming among us, all our hymns used to be used in worship had been in the written language, as had been the case elsewhere, generally in China. His attempt, though, not the only one, was the first which was successfully in introducing the use of Kolek hymns for this purpose. With the aid of native preachers, he prepared some of the hymns used in Amoy and Saito in the spoken dialect of Fu Chao. Though these he first printed in sheet form and used them in street preaching and chapel preaching, so he was convinced that they were in good colloquial style. And then he published them as amended in a book form, and they soon came into general use among us. He showed his usual enthusiasm in introducing his hymns, and the force of his character had much weight in overcoming the prejudices of our better educated Christians to the general use of colloquial hymns. Our hymn book has been much enlarged, but the hymns prepared by Mr. Burns are still general favorites. His influence for good here, doubtless, will be perpetuated for a long time to come through the use of these hymns. In September of the next year, 1860, he returned to the neighborhood of Amoy in consequence of some trying circumstances to which he shall have presented Lee to refer in greater detail, and then, after only a brief stay, passed on to his old home at Chateau, where he found to his joy that the wilderness which he had left so short a time before had begun in a remarkable manner to blossom under the able and devoted laborers of his successor, Mr. Smith. The day after his arrival, he preached to the natives, and the change for the better that had come over the people and their desire to hear the gospel since his first visit five years previously affected him almost to tears on the occasion. Here also he compiled a hymn book in the colloquial dialect, which proved a precious boon to the young converts. He returned to Fuchao in the course of the next year and continued his labors there for some months longer. But meanwhile, events had occurred in the neighborhood of Amoy, which required his presence there for a more lengthened period, and which ultimately led to his removal to the capital city of Peking. Allusions have already been made more than once to the fierce trial to which these infant churches have been almost continually exposed to the bitter opposition and hospitality and hostility of their heathen foreign countrymen, the political jealousy of the ruling class and the, and the religious rancor of the people united in common apathy to the professors of a strange and alien faith. The Mandarin suspected the foreign creed. The multitude hated the singular and exclusive worship. To the philosophical uh, Confucianism, they were obnoxious as fanatics. To the superstitious devotee as enemies of the gods and despisers of the ancestral rites. Hence, a general and constant sentiment of mingled suspicion, dislike, and fear, which was ever in danger on the least provocation of breaking out into a new, into open acts of hostility and lawless violence. They, they were seldom, indeed, called to witness for the divine master unto blood. Never, perhaps, except when some terrible misconception might involve the Christian evangelist in supposed complexity with the schemes of traitors and rebels. But short of this, there was scarcely any extreme of hardship and suffering to which they might not be subjected. Their houses were spoiled, their property was destroyed, the rice fields were laid waste, their cattle were driven away, the pine trees were cut down, they were refused the use of public wells, their supply of laborers was cut off by hostile combinations in time of harvest, their places of worship were rudely assailed, and their sacred assemblies interrupted without hope of protection or redress from any native authority. One or two instances of this petty but vexatious persecution may be given from the letters of the missionaries. Thus, one of the members of the Bay Pei Church, 
of the name of Lot had been called upon to pay the accustomed tribune in support of the idolatrous ceremonies at one of the great feasts. He refused. Forthwith, he was denied water from the public well, and his son was beaten in attempting to fetch it. Then they cut down a large number of his pine trees, which formed a considerable portion of his property. And as he appealed for redress in vain, they proceeded next to cut down his fruit trees. Other members of the same church had their rice fields and other property plundered, and at one time three of the female candidates for baptism were severely beaten by their relatives. At Yang Tiso, Tisao, in the Swato district, one poor widow had her house plundered on the Lord's Day when she was at church. Another member had his field of sugar cane destroyed. A third had his fowl stolen, and all were constantly exposed to the scoffs and reproaches of their fellow vis villagers and the unbelieving members of their own families. Sometimes the malicious designs of the adversary were defeated in singular ways or signally overruled for good. One day the police entered the premises of the old cloth merchant at Petura, intending to plunder or perhaps to seize him. Being rather deaf, he did not hear their demand. But he said, Oh yes, I know what you have come for, in taking down some of his goods. Pointing to the rest, he said, Take them, take them all. I'll go with you too. But I am old and rather deaf. Take my boys too and my little girl there. We are all Christians. We are not afraid. We will go with you. The men, astonished at this novel reception, left the premises without injuring any of the inmates or touching any article of their property. While one was thus preserved by his own simple and unworldly faith, another was secured by the brotherly love of his fellow disciples. An old farmer who resided about five miles from K-H-I-Boyi, a village about 30 miles to the southwest of Petura, having become a Christian, his heathen neighbors evinced their bitter dislike by refusing at harvest time to give him the least assistance in ripening his, reaping his rice fields. On hearing of the old man's troubles, the brethren at uh, Kehai uh, Boyi at once resolved to go to his help. A band of them started one evening for the farm, and commencing operations early next morning, they worked so heartily that the fields were all ripe, reaped in one day, <laughs> to the surprise of their neighbors, and to the comfort and relief of their brother in distress. Such trials as these had fallen off late with peculiar severity on some of the village churches in the Petura district, and called for some vigorous intervention in their behalf on the part of their spiritual overseers. The case of Bay Pei Bay Pei has been already incidentally alluded to. More recently at the above mentioned village of Kehai Boi, where an interesting and prosperous church had been recently established. The disciples had been called to pass, well, yet, as it were, in their very infancy, through a great flight, flight of affliction. On hearing of the disturbances, Mr. Swanson at once repaired to Kehai Boy and was gratified to find that though the persecution still raged, the converts were keeping firm and hopeful, and that 14 of them were in a state of pre preparedness for baptism. No house could be had for divine service, and they had to gather under the shade of a magnificent longing tree. The persecution ceased for a time, but the missionaries were soon again summoned to interpose in their behalf. CHIOH, in whose house the Christians had been in the habit of assembling, was driven from his home, and on his attempting to take refuge in the house of another Christian, the roof was broken in by a mob, and CHIOH prevented from entering. His widowed sister was then attacked, and her son threatened with death unless they complied with their demand for money. A sword was brandished over the lad's head. While well, they required that he should cease to worship God, this he refutely refused, resolutely refused, declaring himself ready to die rather than renounce his faith. CHIOH and another went down to Amoy for advice, and Mr. Burns at once returned with him to see what could be done. While he was attempting to pacify the enraged villagers, one of the converts was set upon by a number of men armed with bludgeons and pikes and severely beaten, and might have been killed, but for his timely intervention. No one, as surely, was ever in a better position to interfere in such a case than one who, for so many years and amidst all his wanderings among this heathen people, had so simply and wholly cast himself in the care of his divine master and had never in any single incident evoked the secure of a secular arm in his own defense. The rights which he had never sought to enforce in his own behalf he could, 
the more boldly and freely and with the greater effect, plead in behalf of others. Ever ready himself to suffer, he was prompt to hold his protecting shield over those who were less able to suffer than he. He spoke accordingly in their behalf with a resolute force and decision, which in dealing with secular matters was not usual with him. A formal representation was made to the Chinese authorities through the British Consul, who himself took up the case most cordially and threatened that if immediate justice were not done, he would report the case to Peking. This produced the desired results. It was promised that the stolen property should be restored and the money given in compensation for property destroyed. But the Christians, before consenting to this offer, preferred consulting Mr. Burns at Amoy, who at once came again to their aid and obtained from the magistrates the following terms. Number one, restoration so far as possible of the very article stolen. Number two, a bond from the enemies to guarantee their non-inferences with the Christians. And number three, a proclamation to be issued exhorting the people not to interfere with Christians. Most happily, all this was agreed to, and the enemies, seeing the whole matter, were taking and fearing the violence of their own authorities, prayed for the inter interposition of the missionaries in their behalf. Mr. Burns gladly used his influence accordingly, and thus all ended well. The stolen property was restored in the presence of the Mandarins, Mr. Burns in an immense concourse of people. The poor Christians carried their pigs and led back their oxen to the homes from which they had so lately been driven, rejoicing, and yet we hope humble. On the same day, the enemies entered into a bond not to interfere with those who were or might become Christians and not to annoy them in any way. And a few days after, the Mandarins issued a proclamation imitating that the case was now settled and strictly forbidding all persons from interfering with anyone who may enter the holy religion of Jesus. Not the least remarkable feature in the termination of these disturbances was that the enemies looked upon the missionaries as their best friends for having shielded them from the severity of the Mandarins. Thus for once, and in behalf of Christ, little ones had the man of the book sustain the character of the vi uh, vigorous, saturous, and successful d diplomacy. The, the storm for the present passed away. Then for a season had the churches rest throughout the towns and villages of Fokin. But the permanent relations of the native Christians towards their heathen countrymen were still in very uncertain and precarious state, and it was thought important that Mr. Burns should proceed to Peking with the view of obtaining a personal interview with Sir Frederick Bruce, and thus, if possible, effecting a more secure and satisfactory settlement. He left Moy accordingly and arrived at the capital in October 1863, thus entering on the last period of his missionary career. And of chapter 19, having been read by Peter John Parisis, also known as Brian Dean, none of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.